Good morning everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. It's May the 6th and we're looking at 2 Kings and chapter 13. Now we have in these passages um, a summary of the lives of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah and often we get some sort of particular incident about their life. And it's very interesting how the inspired writers record often a certain thing, one thing, sometimes even one conversation that takes place or one act that takes place and the whole of their life is summarized um, by that one act which is very interesting. Um, but it's also interesting that when each of them is mentioned um, we have a particular formula. So it's like a sort of a way whereby each of the kings of Israel or Judah are recorded. So it, first of all, it tells us the, the number of years of some other king, very often the king that they succeed. So it's, for example, in verse 1, it says, And the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, son of Jehu began to reign over Israel. So so Joash was in Judah, the southern kingdom, and Jehoahaz was in the northern kingdom, um, where whose center was in Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. And this very much is sort of the formula for each of the descriptions of the kings of Israel and Judah. Now the very next thing that it says very often is that his mother was such and such a person. Now in this particular case, in verse 2, it doesn't say that. You see, you see the inspired writer does not record the person that was the mother of the king Jehoahaz because he was a wicked king. It's of no credit to his mother, the sort of person that he was. But if it was a person, if it was a king that was righteous before the Lord, then almost invariably his mother is mentioned, and it then is to her credit. Very often the mothers of the kings would sit next to them on the throne, and they would be referred to as the queen mother. They were not only the advisors, sorry, the advisors to the kings, but they also were the people that had taught them what's right and wrong from the very earliest times. They're the ones that had smacked the king. They're the ones that had disciplined the king. And now they're the ones that will advise the king. So very often then the, the, the mother is mentioned. But however, in this occasion, Jehoahaz, um, <clears throat> now his mother's not mentioned. And verse 2 is the next aspect of these little potted uh, biographies. It says, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> in the Old Testament, we don't have Christians. There's no Christians in the Old Testament. These people were never saved. You can go through the records of all of these kings. You can go through the record of David, of Solomon. You can go through the record of Daniel, Ezekiel. You'll never find that they have a conversion experience because they're not Christians. They're not saved by grace through faith in believing the gospel. No, these are people who are already part of the covenant people. They're people that are part of Israel who, who already are in covenant. So they're in a relationship with God already. And that relationship is under the old covenant. And in the old covenant, there were two designations. They were either those that did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, or they were those, those that did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now those that did that which was evil are called sinners. They are the wicked. These are the ones that refuse or are unable to, to live up to the standard of the law that God has put the people under. But those that do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord, well, they sin too, but they always seek a sin offering and they always seek um, the means that God has given in the covenant for them to be able to be restored to the Lord their God. Now, none of them ever become Christians. And so what we need to understand is that outside of Christianity, 
In Israel and in the world, there are two types of people. There are those that do evil in the sight of the Lord, and they are called the wicked and they will perish. They are referred to as sinners. But there are also those that do right in the eyes of the Lord. They are called the righteous. But they're not righteous by faith in the Lord Jesus like a Christian is. They are righteous in the eyes of the Lord because they do that which is right according to the law that God has them under. So if they're a Jew, then they're righteous in the sight of the Lord because of the law of Moses. But if they're a Gentile, then they're righteous in the sight of the Lord under the law of Noah. So this is something that as Christians, we need to just get our head together and understand that this is this is the situation. Now, with all of these kings, the next the next designation is who they follow. You see, now, if they're righteous, then they are following David, who served the Lord with all his heart. But. But in this particular case, Jehoaz, now he followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now that little word follow, it's the word disciple. He was a disciple of Jeroboam who made Israel to sin and not depart and did not depart therefrom. Now, the third, the next thing that's mentioned in each of the times uh, when a king of Israel or Judah is mentioned is what God does in response. Now, in verse three, it says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of Haziel, king of Syria, and into the hands of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, all their days. So, <clears throat> now, Jehoaz, now it says how he responded to how God disciplined him. It says, Jehoaz besought the Lord, and the Lord hearkened unto him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. So you can see that the career of each of these kings If they're wicked, it's very similar. And if they're righteous, it's very similar. In this particular case, Jehoaz, he seeks the Lord because of the disciplining hand of God in judgment by allowing the enemy to come and oppress them. He sought the Lord. Now, in verse five, which is my password for today, there's a beautiful expression. It's in it's in it's in brackets and it could be a scribal edition. Not sure. It says the Lord gave Israel a savior. So they went out from under the hand of the Syrians and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Got that? They dwelt in their tents as before time. So what it's saying is we don't know who the person was. But God, at this particular time, raised up an unknown saviour. Now, it might have been a prophet, or it might have been a military leader, like one of the judges, we don't know. But in some way, he delivers Israel from the Syrians. Okay? And he gives uh, the children of Israel, they, they live in their tents like they did in years gone by when they were in the wilderness. However, and this is the next thing, verse 6, he says, Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin, but walked therein, and there remained the grove also in Samaria. Now, (coughs) what we see in this particular case is that, um, yes, They did repent. They did return to the Lord their God and the Lord did deliver them. However, they did not completely follow the Lord. And there's a little word not mentioned in this passage, but there's a little word often used about whether their heart was perfect before the Lord. Now, this is a word that's used in the book of Hebrews. It's one of the key words of the book of Hebrews and it refers to Israel who has a full heart of perfect obedience to the Lord their God. 
and of course the writer to the Hebrew is speaking um, after the cross he's speaking after the resurrection and he's calling upon the Hebrew nation it's to the Hebrews he's writing he's not writing to Christians he's writing to those in the Hebrew nation and he's giving them instruction that they might fear the Lord and they might follow the Lord Jesus as their rightful Messiah and King because the kingdom is coming and they're not to forsake the Lord like their fathers did when they were in the wilderness notice it's their fathers um, the, in right through the epistle to the Hebrews we get this reference to their fathers he says right in the beginning very beginning it says um, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake unto our fathers by the prophets so <coughs> it's written to the Hebrew people of the New Testament times now we won't go through all of the records of all of the kings recorded in this passage but it's quite a sad um, it's quite a sad story what I will do is I'll bring before your attention a wonderful incident Elisha had fallen sick and Joash the king of Israel came down to him and wept over his faith that's a wonderful thing and he said my father my father the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof that's the description he gives of Elisha he calls him the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof and Elisha says take bow and arrows and he took um, took unto him bows and arrows and he said to the king of Israel put forth thine hand upon the bow and he put his hand upon it and Elisha put his hand upon the king's hands and he said open the window eastward and he opened it and Elijah said shoot and he shot and he said the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of the deliverance of Syria for thou shalt smite the Syrians in effect until thou hast consumed them then he said take the arrows and he took them and he said to the king of Israel smite them upon the ground and he smote the ground three times and then he stopped and the man of God was cross with him he says why didn't you smite the ground five times or six times then you would have smitten Syria until you had consumed it well as now you will only conquer Syria three times in battle <coughs> fascinating isn't it these passages are, are, are the are the stuff of Sunday school lessons but they are beautiful and so instructive um, another interesting thing that comes out in the passage is um, the uh, Moabite bands come into the land one year um, and uh, some men are burying a man and they see they see a band of men coming so they cast the man quickly into the sepulchre of Elisha and when the dead man was let down into the grave when his body touched the bones of Elisha he revived and stood upon his feet <laughs> now that's wonderful I don't know whether you believe in that but I believe in resurrection okay and I believe that there will come a time when every man that's ever lived will stand upon his feet again they will either stand upon their feet in the glorious kingdom of the Lord Jesus or they will stand upon their feet at the great white throne in order to be judged and sent to the lake of fire now that's enough for today um, it's fantastic it just goes through king after king after king northern and southern and uh, there's a lot there to feed our souls today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Look forward to speaking to you again tomorrow. Bye for now.